Happy Earth Week and welcome all of you to an in-depth discussion with Amazon Watch Executive Director Layla Salazar Lopez. In a few minutes, she will share the importance of the Amazon ecosystem and how her organization is working to protect the rainforest. Amazon Watch is the inaugural Philanthropy Awards Bay Area winner for environment, and the Make It Better Foundation recognizes Amazon Watch for their exceptional work protecting the Earth's most valuable resources, the Amazon, and supporting indigenous-led solutions. Layla is a mother, a proud Chicano Latina woman, and a passionate defender of Mother Earth, the Amazon, indigenous rights, and climate justice. For more than 20 years, Layla has worked to defend the world's rainforest, human rights, and climate through grassroots organizing and international advocacy campaigns at Amazon Watch, Rainforest Action Network and Global Exchange. I'm confident you will be inspired by Layla's passionate message today. Don't forget to join us after the event in our lounge for an ongoing conversation with Layla after her presentation. But in the meanwhile, Layla, quick question. On our drive to the San Francisco airport last fall, you described your on-ramp to the environmental protection cause as a determined young teenager. There was something about a volunteer fair, folks canvassing for new recruits, a sign-up table at school cafeteria. It was kind of a simple gateway to a very meaningful life purpose. Perhaps a listener today will find their on-ramp through your story. I hope you can share a little bit more as you introduce us to Amazon Watch. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. Happy Earth Week. Um, as we celebrate Earth Day on Friday and um, think about our Mother Earth, um, I just want to first uh, acknowledge the land that we're on, the land that we are sitting on here in the San Francisco Bay Area, Bay Area uh, is the Ohlone People's Territory, unceded Ohlone People's Territory. Um, and so I just want to first acknowledge that we're on this beautiful land of the Ohlone peoples. And um, yes, uh, also want to say thank you to you, Sharon, and everyone at Make It Better Media um, for the acknowledgement of Amazon Watch um, in the awards last fall. And so happy to be partnering with you all and speaking to you all today. Um, when I think about Earth Day, I think about how I got involved in, in this work. Um, people ask me all the time, you know, what is a, you know, why are you involved in, why have you dedicated your life to uh, protecting and defending the Amazon rainforest? It's so far away. Um, you know, you're Chicana, your, your family's from Mexico. Why, why, why don't you work on issues uh, around California and Mexico, and I do. Um, but my life's work started um, I I at an Earth Day fair, actually. Um, when I was in high school, Oceanside High School in Southern California, um, uh, we had an Earth Fair for Earth Day at our, at our, at our high school. And um, we had a guest speaker from the Amazon, and he came and gave a slideshow about um, about the Amazon rainforest, in particular the Ecuadorian Amazon and protecting the Ecuadorian Amazon. And I just fell in love with the, the photos and the forest. And after he gave his speech, I, after he showed us his slideshow, I, I went up to him and I said, I would love to go there someday. And this is me as a 16 year old uh, with wide eyes and you know the future ahead of me. And I said, I would really love to go there someday. I would love to see it. Um, before it's cut down. I would love to see it before it's burnt down. Um, so I kind of have this uh, fatalistic view, but I, I also have this hopeful view of, of wanting to see the forest and wanting to do something to, to protect it. Um, and fast forward a couple years later, when I was a student at UC Santa Barbara for my environmental studies program, um, I was asked to do an internship and um, it was one of the requirements of the environmental studies program. And um, they said, you know, why don't you, you know, you have to pick an in a summer internship volunteering with a local environmental organization or um, a local congressional office. And I said, I want to go to the Amazon. 
I will never forget the photos from the Amazon and that's where I want to go. And, um, and so that's what I chose. I, I chose to visit the Hatun Sacha biological station in Ecuador. Um, and that began my, my connection to the Amazon rainforest. Um, I went originally to, to see the trees and to plant trees and to study ethnobotany. Um, and I did that, but I also realized that um, it is the indigenous peoples who have that knowledge, who have that, that library of knowledge, of traditional knowledge of all of the plants, of all of the animals, of the balance um, of life that the Amazon provides for um, not only for the local environment where they live, but for the whole entire planet. So um, that's a little bit of the story of how I came to do this work. Um, and at that time, Amazon Watch didn't exist. Um, it was founded a few years later. Um, but for those of you who don't know, Amazon Watch, we are a nonprofit organization uh, he founded here in California in 1996. We work to protect and defend the Amazon rainforest. Um, the Amazon rainforest, we work to protect and defend our global climate. And we do that in solidarity with indigenous peoples. Um, I have a couple slides I would love to show you all um, to just kind of, so that you can all get a picture. Um, just like I did when I was 16 years old, I would love to show you all some uh, photos of the Amazon. Uh oh, let's get this up here. All right, here we go. So this is um, this is the Amazon rainforest, the largest and most biodiverse tropical rainforest on our planet. Uh, many of you know the Amazon rainforest as the biggest rainforest. You may know the Amazon River as the biggest river. Um, you may not know that above the rainforest um, is actually a river that is three times as large. Um, they're known as the flying rivers of the Amazon. Those billions of trees across the Amazon um, that contain that moisture and um, create the rain clouds, create the rainfall for the Amazon, for the life of the Amazon. They also create the rainfall for all of the Americas, all the way to South, all across South America, and even up to California, where we live, all the way up to the Rockies, to the Sierras. Our rainfall is comes from the weather system that comes from the Amazon rainforest. Um, and so I'm mentioning this so that you all know uh, that the Amazon rainforest is, yes, the largest and most bioculturally diverse rainforest on our planet. It is also critical, critical for our global weather system, for the stability and the balance of our global weather system. Um, so this is just an emblematic photo from above of the Amazon forest and the rivers, the winding rivers of the Amazon. Um, and unfortunately, the Amazon rainforest is under massive threat. Uh, it is facing what we call a tipping point or what scientists call a tipping point. This is the point of, uh, point of no return the point of ecological collapse. Um, yes, that is doom and gloom. It is apocalyptic. It is horrible to think about. Um, and this is what um, we've been saying for a long time, ever since Amazon Watch existed. Um, we've been saying the Amazon is under threat. The Amazon is under threat. The Amazon is, um, you know, being deforested. It's being degraded by multiple factors, by multiple drivers, um, which you all may have heard about um, logging, both legal and illegal, mining, oil extraction, mega dams, agricultural expansion, uh, and colonization, continued colonization of the, um, the lands of indigenous peoples who are protecting the Amazon rainforest. Um, and I'm going to get to 
to that in just a second, but I, I wanted to bring this attention to this photo, um, which shows many of the thousands of fires that um, that were in the that were set ablaze in the in the Amazon in 2019. In 2019, in August of 2019, the world was awakened to uh, the reality facing the Amazon rainforest, which was that it was under massive attack by uh, the Brazilian government, by governments across the Amazon rainforest. But I specifically mentioned the Brazilian government because um, uh, three, a, a little bit over three years ago, the um, Brazilian government actually, um, under the leadership of Jair Bolsonaro, really um, set a plan to, um, to develop and destroy the Amazon rainforest and the indigenous peoples who protect it. And this is one of the results um, followed, um, in incentivized by um, this, this destruction um, and development of the Amazon, um, the rainforest uh, was set ablaze intentionally um, by land grabbers who wanted to take the rainforest and the lands of indigenous peoples to make way for agribusiness, for large scale agribusiness, for cattle, for soy, um, to make way for um, her quote unquote development. Um, this is just um, one of the, um, this is what you can see after the forest was set ablaze, you can see the difference between um, the primary rainforest. So we're talking about rainforest that has been there for thousands of years, that has been protected by indigenous peoples, um, set ablaze to make way for development. And then on the other side, you can see the, the, the primary rainforest and indigenous lands. Um, these are some of the, just a few um, impacts, um, few, few photos of the impacts of oil development of logging, of mining expansion and extraction across the Amazon. These are um, some of the major threats facing the Amazon right now, which is the reason why the Amazon is at a tipping point. The scientists used to say um, not too long ago that the Amazon rainforest would reach a tipping point at 40 to 50% deforestation and degradation. But about a year ago, they said, um, they, they, they split that prediction in half and said that um, at around 20 to 25%, the Amazon would be a tipping, at a tipping point. And unfortunately, the deforestation and degradation of the Amazon has already reached over 21% and has increased just in the last few years, um, um, in particular because of these, uh, the increased deforestation in Brazil and the fires. Um, and so, there are parts of the Brazilian Amazon that have already reached the tipping point. It's not near, it's already here. And, um, and this is very concerning um, to science. It's very concerning to our global climate. Um, and it's obviously very, very concerning to indigenous peoples and the peoples who have been caretaking uh, and protecting the Amazon rainforest for a millennia. Um, and indigenous peoples, um, have, have put out the call to protect 80% of the Amazon rainforest by 2025. Why do we say, why are they saying, and why have we joined their call to protect 80% of the Amazon by 2025? Because right now, 50% uh, of the Amazon is in protected areas or indigenous people's territories. Another 20%, as I mentioned, has been deforested and degraded. So urgently to maintain climate stability, to stop the incrementation of the tipping point, we need to urgently and permanently protect 80% of the Amazon rainforest by 2025. That is really soon. That is really soon. It's a few years away. Um, and it is very ambitious, but it is what is needed if we want to avoid the tipping point. 
if we want to maintain climate stability, if we want to maintain our weather system, if we want to avoid drought in the Amazon and in California, where we know that um, those of us who are who live in California, we have been faced with drought and fires ourselves. The fires that we face are wildfires and they are driven by climate change and drought. Um, and we now have to worry about um, these wildfires and these forest fires every single summer and fall. Um, and we, you know, for our, all of our collective future, we need to um, we need to protect our climate and we need to protect the Amazon. And that's why we're calling, we're joining the call of indigenous peoples and science by saying permanently protect 80% of the Amazon by 2025. And so this fall, we, um, we uh, did some actions. It was a global week of action for the Amazon this fall. Um, and we took action um, in San Francisco and you can see the, this visual of this giant mural paint, painted on a street in San Francisco, in downtown San Francisco. Um, and it was painted on the, uh, on the street in front of the offices of BlackRock. Um, BlackRock is the biggest investor in climate destruction around the world. It is one of the biggest investors of fossil fuels and climate destruction around the world. And so there is a global campaign called BlackRock's Big Problem, which Amazon Watch is a part of. And we joined our allies in calling on BlackRock and other um, asset managers, financial institutions who are investing in climate destruction and who are complicit in, this, in the destruction of the Amazon rainforest. So this is just one of the actions that, that we do um, as we take action to protect the Amazon. I'm going to pause here um, because I think we, you know, I'm, I'm talking a lot and um, I know, uh, Sharon, you have some other questions. I'm here. Um, I really appreciate your emphasis on the same point. Um, thank you for giving us a bit of the current state of the Amazon, but let's talk a little bit more about why it's important that we're having this conversation now on Earth Day 2022. Yeah, you know, I mean... Yeah, I kind of just kind of went right into it from the, you know, from talking about how I got started and thinking about Earth Day. Um, you know, when we, I think I would be remiss to say that, you know, this is a, this is a very difficult time, mm. right? We're, we're, we're living in a very challenging, difficult time of global crises. Um, you know, the, you know, when we think about protecting our Earth, you know, we think about, yes, of course, the, the natural environment, um, the forests. Uh, we think about, you know, all of our ecosystems that are in interconnected. Um, you know, I would be remiss to, to say that, you know, we're, you know, we th I think about the, the, the threats to our global planet, mm -hmm. climate change and war. Um, we are living at a time of pandemic, a global pandemic. We're still in it. We're not out of it. Um, we're still in a global pandemic. We're in a time of, uh, social and racial reckoning of healing and forgiveness, right? We're in a, we're, we're going through a very difficult, challenging time. And, um, this is a time for us to think about, you know, how do we heal? How do we come together? How do we support those who are on the front lines? You know, we have to also acknowledge that this is, we're living in a time of great, great, great inequity. And many of those who are um, facing the hardest and mm -hmm. most difficult parts of the global pandemic and the climate crisis and the social and racial economic divides um, are black indigenous and people of color mm. and indigenous peoples um, in the Amazon are on the front lines. Indigenous you mentioned the women defenders earlier. Mm -hmm. So I, I, 
unpack that for us a little bit. What are some actions, current actions that um, these indigenous women are leading throughout the Amazon? Can you give us some specifics? Sure. Um, again, I'm going to point to these slides. Um, these are slides that were just taken a few uh, a few weeks ago in Ecuador um, with the opening of the Casa de Mujeres Amazonicas, which is a Women Defenders House, the Amazon Women Defenders House. So in honor um, and acknowledgement of International Women's Day and Women's Month last month in March, um, the Mujeres Amazonicas Collective, which is a collective of indigenous women defenders of the Amazon against extraction, um, they came together and inaugurated their house, their house, uh, their gathering house, their house of healing, their house of action, their house of unity and coming together. Um, and this is, um, this is a, a beautiful example of uh, women supporting each other, women working mm -hmm. together from lots of different nationalities. Um, imagine, I mean, these are women from seven different indigenous nationalities just in the southern part of the Ecuadorian Amazon. Um, they're women that come from very, very far away um, in their villages. They have to travel by canoe, um, by road, some by air. Um, in small planes to get to the nearest town. And when they get to the nearest towns, um, you know, many times they don't have anywhere to stay. And so, um, and this was very, very clear during the pandemic um, when people were very isolated um, and very remote. And when they needed to come into the community, into the town, they needed a place to stay. And so the women were on the front lines of, of the COVID crisis. Um, in addition to being on the front lines of the climate crises, oil spills and flooding and um, deforestation and um, oil extraction, all of these different threats came at the same time. And so the women defenders who had already been, who have already been working since 2013, have been working together to um, defend their rights, defend their territories from oil extraction in particular. Um, they, they had already been working together, um, but during the time of the pandemic, it really just, everything really solidified for them to come together even more. And um, this, this women's house is symbolic of, of their work, um, not only in the past, but in the future. Um, and so indigenous women, um, this is just one example this is just one example of the Mujeres Amazonicas, who are a fierce women's collective um, doing work to defend rights, lives, and territories. And many of them have been threatened um, physically, um, have been have received death threats um, for their defense for their work to defend their territories. Um, and this is just one. One example, um, while we were in Ecuador, we also, um, uh, Amazon Watch, we supported the, the Casa de Mujeres um, through our Amazon Defenders Fund and also through our Ecuador program. Um, our Amazon Defenders for program is a solidarity grant making initiative um, where we di provide direct uh, solidarity funds to indigenous peoples across the Amazon. And um, we've been proud to support Mujeres Amazonicas and also Confeniai, which is the Federation of Indigenous Peoples of the Ecuadorian Amazon. We supported the Women's March on in Indigenous People on, on International Women's Day. Um, and in Brazil, um, I'm just so, let me see, I think the next slide is, is no, I'm actually gonna go back one slide. Here we are. In Brazil, um, there is a, a women's collective as well called Anmiga, which is um, indigenous women uh, warriors, indigenous women warriors of the of across Brazil, um, of all the different ecosystems and territories of, of Brazil. And um, Indigenous Women's Day in Brazil is actually in September, on September 5th. And, um, and they organized the biggest mobilization of indigenous women ever. And 
one of the things uh, I'm just so inspired by is their mandate that is called uh, reflorestando menchis, which means refor uh, reforesting our minds, bringing forth the indigenous cosmovision and the knowledge of indigenous peoples to the world. Which, what, what does that really mean? That means one of the things that they say, and it just always stays with me, is you know, violence against the earth is violence against women. And if we support women, we're also supporting the protection of Mother Earth. And they have a whole mandate, a beautiful mandate that is about, you know, having a different vision and how we see and treat women and how we see and treat the earth. And just that, that is a simple phrase, but a, such a powerful phrase um, that guides the work of women, indigenous women in Brazil, that then leads into the national movement of, of indigenous peoples across Brazil. And so these photos right here were just taken last week in Brazil. Um, the free land camp is, um, in, in Portuguese, it's called the uh, um, Acampamento Teja Livre. And Teja Livre means free land. And it is a, a mobilization of indigenous peoples across Brazil to protect the land, the indigenous people's land, to protect the territories of indigenous peoples and to protect the rights of indigenous peoples, which are very, very, very much under threat, as I mentioned earlier. Um, in particular, right now, the Brazilian government is um, threatening to uh, roll back the constitution to, um, to take away indigenous people's lands, to basically not demarcate or designate any more land to indigenous peoples, and also take away land um, from indigenous peoples, and is also threatening to allow mining on over 16 million hectares of land in the Brazilian Amazon. Um, so if you could imagine, um, you know, some of the photos of destruction that I showed earlier and imagine that expanding throughout the Brazilian Amazon and indigenous people's lands, it would, it's a death sentence. And that's why indigenous peoples in Brazil um, call it actually a genocidal policy. Um, it's not an exaggeration to say that the, the threats of the Bolsonaro government against indigenous people are genocidal because they are directly attacking their right to survive and to live on their own land. Um, and so last week um, and for, for the last two weeks, actually indigenous peoples organized the biggest mobilization in history. Um, over 7,000 indigenous warriors um, mobilized in Brasilia and, and continue and continue to mobilize. So, um, yeah, the women are are such a source of inspiration and such an, a source of hope. Well, that's a powerful story and I'm really moved. Imagine our audience is moved. So much of what we realize is that we read and hear and learn, but we wanna do something, you know? So how, how can people, you know, tuning in today support these indigenous women warriors yeah, um, a couple of different ways. Um, uh, we, we put together this, um, this fancy little slide here um, to make it easy for you all to continue supporting this work. Um, and so we encourage you all to continue to support the work of Amazon Watch, to, 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 to work with us and stand with us to protect and defend the Amazon and our climate in solidarity with indigenous peoples, you all can join uh, Make It Better, uh, the Make It Better Foundation in supporting Amazon Watch. And we are so grateful again for um, the award, which actually um, Make It Better supported Amazon Watch um, with a $10,000 award and um, we're going to use that award as a match for this week to try to raise another ten thousand um, dollars to to continue this work. As you as you heard, 
this work is, yes, very uh, intense. It's very urgent. It's very critical. Um, and your support and your contribution, your donation today uh, will help directly support our work, our work with Indigenous peoples, our work um, defending defenders, our work to hold those corporations like BlackRock and Vanguard um, and Chevron and Anglo-American and Geopark uh, and so many of these companies that are still are still moving forward with their um, exploitative, extractive mm -hmm. models of, of destruction. Um, and so we're working to hold those corporations accountable. And through our Amazon Defenders Fund, we are directly supporting indigenous peoples on the front lines. Um, and we are taking action. So we would encourage you all to donate. You could actually, you know, hold your phone up to the to the screen and scan um, that QR code uh, to make a contribution today. You could also go to amazonwatch.org slash donate. Um, and you can take action. You can um, sc scan that QR code and that'll take you to our action page mm -hmm. uh, where you can take many different actions to defend earth defenders, to protect 80% of the Amazon by 2025, uh, to end California's consumption of Amazon crude. And I'm gonna get to that in a second. And to have the banks, the financial actors exit Amazon oil and gas immediately. We're so, proud to, to plant that match challenge put that out there i know your supporters are motivated um we want this to be a frontline response you know other than action in the way of donation where what are some sources of hope you're feeling right now in this work you're doing where do you find hope um well i mentioned one of them which is um the women. Yeah. Um, one of the reasons I traveled to Ecuador, which I hadn't done in about three years. Um, one of the reasons I went um, in March was to be with the women. Um, you know, this work is challenging. It's, it definitely has its, its, its days of, of devastation, right? You look at mm -hmm. some of the photos, you look at, you know, some of the threats against the peoples and there are some, 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 some down days. Um, and so one of the things that really fills me up is, is being with our partners, um, you know, um, standing direct, you know, standing with them, spending time with them, brainstorming with them, um, meeting with them, you know, having, sharing meals and um, marching with them. So that definitely brings me inspiration and hope. Um, then also just being in the forest, being mm -hmm. being able to have that time in 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 the Amazon, um, just definitely inspires me to keep going. Um, I have a short little story that I actually um, actually was in the Peruvian Amazon in January, um, which I hadn't been to this part of the Peruvian Amazon in in ever actually in Shipibo territory in the central Peruvian Amazon and. Um, I had asked one of our partners if if he would he would um, give us permission or if he would take us to um, uh, their um, their community protected area, hmm. and um, we took a canoe about half an hour from the community. Um, we walked for about an hour into the forest, mm -hmm. and um, I was looking at this large woody vine. Um, it's called a liana. For those of you who don't know, there's there, there are um, vines that are wood that are um, there are um, they could be as, as small as you know as a as a branch or they could be really really large. And there was this huge vine, and it was twisted. It looked like almost like a DNA um, a DNA structure. And I was looking and I started taking a picture of it. I said, like, this is so beautiful. I was taking a picture of it. And I look up, as I, I look up and with my camera, I see these two eyes. 
and they were huge eyes, black eyes. And I didn't even stutter. And I was like, oh my gosh, ocelot. And I thought it was a baby ocelot. And um, it was actually a, a, I mean, it was the most beautiful animal. And it was sitting there just looking at me. It didn't, it didn't move. It didn't run away until, until we scared it <laughs> until my friend came and scared it. But, um, it was just so beautiful to see this animal, um, staring directly at us. And it just gave me hope that, you know, this, that there are still, um, although there are not many, there are still these sacred animals, these mm -hmm. really sacred animals, um, there in the forest. And even um, our friend Ednan, who, who the reason he scared him away was because he was so excited to see the animal. He, mm -hmm. you know, Ednan, there's a tigrillo. And he came and he saw it and he, he was like, wow, you know, that's not so often we get to see these beautiful animals. You know, they're really deep in the forest and you got, you got lucky. You got lucky to be able to see this animal. Um, and I tell that story because um, that is, you know, that is like one of the reasons why I continue to do this work is, is to see um, that beauty, to feel that beauty, to know that this is a place of great biodiversity. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is a source of life. It is a source of life um, for the Amazon, but it's a source of life for our planet. Um, and as long as we see those kinds of animals and we know that there's still hope, we know that there's still balance in the ecosystem. When those really, really rare animals start to disappear, then, mm -hmm. uh, then, then that's when it becomes really scary. It is, mm -hmm. I mean, it is, it is um, quite scary to see the threats, to see the threats against the forest, the animals, and the um, and I, I, I would be remiss to say that, you know, um, that we cannot, can, we cannot protect the forest and we cannot protect the animals and the plants and the mega biodiversity of the Amazon without the peoples who live there, who have been living there for thousands of years, who are the best protectors of the forest. Um, and that's the reason why much of the forest remains standing. The reason why it remains standing is because indigenous peoples have been protecting that land um, for thousands of years. And that's really the, the 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 reason why at Amazon Watch we we do this work directly and collectively with indigenous peoples in solidarity with them um, because they're the ones who have been protecting um, and defending for so long. Um, so that's you know it gives me hope to. The women give me hope, the young people, you know, the youth um, in the Amazon and around the world, right? I mean, um, I, I, I have two young daughters and um, I, I think about their future and, um, and I want them to have, um, to have a, a future on this beautiful planet with clean air and clean water and a clean environment and racial and social justice and climate justice. And um, I, I love seeing that the young people are, are taking action for climate justice, um, are taking action for um, in, in a much more um, direct and diverse way than, than we did. Um, and so I, um, I'm inspired by, I'm inspired by the youth. And I think we all need to take more direction from, from mm -hmm. young people and listen to young people who are, who are, um, who are not, you know, haven't been jaded by, um, by the system, right? You know, we, we still have, even though we, you know, we've been at this for a long time. Um, we, we, we have to continue to find new, strategies and new voices. And um, I think the voices that are the strongest right now are the voices of, of indigenous peoples, of women, of youth, of um, people on the front lines, 
uh, Black, Indigenous, people of color um, are on the front lines. And um, it is really critical that we all stand with them, um, with us. Um, I wanted to, since we're here in California, and I know not everyone's in California, but since many of us are, um, I wanted to um, be sure to talk about our California and, and Amazon crew campaign, and particularly the tie to California. Um, I don't know if you all are, are aware, but um, over 50% of the oil that comes from the Amazon, that is exported from the Amazon comes to the United States. And over 60% of that that comes to the United States goes comes here to California. Mm. And so basically the oil, you know, the photos of oil spills and oil extraction that we see in the Ecuadorian Amazon, for example. And there have been many oil spills just in the last few years and even few months. And if we see those pictures with, with um Again, you know, in a in a in a shock with with shock and awe, mm -hmm. then we also need to think about where is that you know why is this happening? Um, where is that oil going? Um, and some of the oil that is extracted from the Ecuadorian Amazon and the Yasuni National Park, the most biologically diverse part of the Amazon, some of it is staying in Ecuador and in the region, but that which is exported. The majority is coming to California. Mm. The majority are coming to ports in Los Angeles and here in the Bay Area. To Chevron, which has a legacy, a toxic legacy of, um, of destruction in the Amazon, in the Ecuadorian Amazon. We're still getting oil from the Amazon here in California and here in the Bay. And so knowing this, um, you know, we cannot just put the pressure on the Ecuadorian government or the corporations. We also need to put the pressure on our own here in California. And we are in engaging with the state of California in calling on the state to make a commitment, make a pledge to end Amazon crude, end our addiction and our dependency on Amazon crude. We're actually importing more oil from the Amazon than Saudi Arabia. Considering the crisis that we're in right now, um, the climate crisis and the the war, um, we really need to think. We need to take this as a as an urgent test for fast tracking our transition, our just transition away from fossil fuels. Our state has already made major commitments to. Um, reducing emissions and um, reducing our dependency on, on fossil fuel guzzling cars. Um, and we've already made commitments to, um, to you know, reduce extraction near schools and near childcare centers and have setbacks. Um, for where fracking wells or oil wells can be next to um, um, schools or child care centers and homes. But we really need to make, if we want to be a climate leader here in California, um, we need to set a better example. California has been a leader since the beginning of Earth Day. California has been, um, ever since the 1969 oil spill in Santa Barbara, which actually sparked the environmental movement and sparked the first Earth Day. Um, Ever since then, California has been the first to make so many of the efforts that we need to, to protect our environment and protect our people on the planet. Um, but we still have a long way to go. We cannot call ourselves a climate leader if we are still expanding extraction of fossil fuels in our state. And if we are continuing to support the extraction an expansion of fossil fuels in the Amazon. So what we want to see is um, the state of California um, make a commitment to not import any more fossil fuels from the Amazon um, and stop expansion 
of fossil fuels in California and the Amazon. Um, and to also to be really clear, you know, for our listeners and for our supporters that we want the state of California to take a lead and we want it to be done in a direct way and not in a way of market offsets, the carbon offsets, because carbon offsets are not the solution to reducing emissions. They only offset them. They allow polluters to continue to pollute. Polluters like Chevron can say, we're investing in protecting the Amazon while they're actually incentivizing extraction and expansion of the destruction of the Amazon. So we do not support market-based offsets for um, reducing emissions or, or stopping deforestation. We need to do it directly and we need to do, we need to support directly the peoples on the ground um, who are on the front lines, whether it's Richmond, California next to the refinery or it's um, in the Yasuni National Park uh, where um, oil extraction is, is, is currently um, taking place. Mm -hmm. Well, those are some very tangible ways um, to stand behind this movement. And I'm just going to remind our audience right now, if there are questions that you'd like us to offer up, uh, please go ahead and include those in the chat. Um, you know, you mentioned a while back that just there's just a lot of noise, right? There's just a lot of noise going on in, in the information world. And uh, yet the voice of these Indigenous women, the voice of Amazon Watch is important. And I'm I, I want to not miss the chance for our audience to learn how they can stay connected to your work. Um, how, what, where can they continue to track, get involved, amplify? Um, you know, where's the next Gaylord Nelson? You know, how can he, you know, it was founding Earth Day. I mean, have, there are other people equally passionate who want to engage and stand behind. Mm -hmm. Um. There's, you know, one, I mean, again, I took the take action slide down, but, um, you know, we, you know, we encourage you all um, to uh, follow us on social media. Um, you know, we, we are constantly posting updates, um, updates, um, ways to take action on a daily and weekly basis on our social media. We're constantly... Mm -hmm posting um, webinars and conversations um, of not only ourselves and our staff, but primarily actually our indigenous allies and our frontline community allies. Um, part of our mission at Amazon Watch is to amplify the voices, the solutions, the resistance of indigenous peoples. Um, and so that is that is that is actually a very big part of our mission is to amplify. Um, and and we do that through our social media. We do that through lots of different forms of multimedia. We do it through partnerships with indigenous media makers, um, including Media India in Brazil and uh, Voz de Confeña in, in Ecuador. Um, so um, if you follow us on social media, whether it be, you know, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, we're on all of them. <laughs> so um, you can you can follow us on social media to, to remain engaged. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I, I, I know that if you follow us there, you will you will find many sources of inspiration, um, mm -hmm. you know, I, I do this work every day and sometimes I see something pop up on our social media or, or that of one of our partners and, um, and just, you know, so inspired. Um, I mean, just yesterday, for example, um, uh, was the Dia do Indio in Brazil, which means Indian Day. And the indigenous movement in Brazil said, no, it's not Indian Day. It's our day of it's the day of resistance of indigenous peoples. And we don't actually wanna be called Indian. We're mm. indigenous and we wanna be respected. And they're all throughout the day yesterday, there were posts of um, indigenous peoples resisting, resisting the threats and the attacks and the uh, rollback of rights um, and 
yes, they were resisting. And there were also many beautiful, just so many beautiful photos and videos of um, indigenous peoples um, dancing and indigenous peoples on their land um, and elders um, sharing wisdom. And that is why we do this work, you know, mm -hmm. to also um, uplift and amplify um, the voices and solutions and resistance of indigenous peoples. Um, those are our, those are our, um, our leaders. Those are our guides in our work um, every day. Um, and many of them um, are superstars. <laughs> they are, you know, they are, you know, just, um, you know, I, I, it makes me think about the last um, climate conference, which I think I got back from just a few days before the award ceremony. In mm -hmm. um, and COP26 this year was dominated by um, the fossil fuel industry, which is the reason why we don't have a uniform and we don't have a climate agreement that um, mm -hmm. is ambitious enough to really solve our climate crisis um, because the fossil fuel industry continues to dominate um, the climate talks. Um, but the hopeful part of, the, of COP26 was that it was also dominated by indigenous peoples by frontline communities, by women. And everywhere you went in the halls of that conference, of that summit in Glasgow, um, there were indigenous people speaking truth to power. Um, and every media from around the world, whether it was The Guardian or the BBC or Sky News, um, everyone wanted to interview and amplify the voices of indigenous peoples. And mm. that was the first time that I had ever seen the global communities say, you know what, they're right. We need to be investing in protecting forests. We need to be investing in protecting, and so we need to be investing in supporting indigenous people's voices and solutions for protecting the forests. And there were massive investments and commitments made at COP26 to protect uh, the forests and for mm -hmm. um, indigenous peoples. And we wanna see it put in action. We want to see it put in action, and um, it's it's just beautiful to see the the young people and the women and indigenous peoples um, um, in the limelight, and um, and they are they are our heroes. They are our, our defenders. Thank you for standing side by side with women defenders for indigenous people for uh, those of us who. Uh, are still learning and needing someone to show us the way. You've been um, a model and a true example of living your life um, with integrity, um, responding to that call as a teenager and living a meaningful uh, purpose in your career and passion. I hope that our listeners have been inspired and I encourage them to take note of the many resources that Amazon Watch has been populating in the chat, uh, links to various resources and in further information about some of the things that Layla has touched on today. Layla, it's been a pleasure. And I just so enjoyed our time in the fall celebrating our Amazon Watch and now being uh, here and able to provide a platform for you to um, educate and inspire us. I have one wish. I have one more. Um, I'm just assuming that there's many people from California on this um, on this call. But even if you're not, I just want to also um, invite you to um, an upcoming event, um, which is the Bioneers Conference. Yeah. Um, uh, for many of those here in the Bay Area, you know, this is a this is a, a, a wonderful time for us to come together at the annual Bioneers Conference. And it hasn't happened in person for a few years due to the pandemic. It's It's been um, held in Marin at the Marin um, Civic Auditorium for many, many years, um, for over 20 years. And this year and last couple of years, it's been virtual. And this year, um, Bioneers is gonna be held um, May 13th through 15th in San Francisco 
at the Palace of Fine Arts. And um, I'm inviting you all because we'll be there. We are proud partners um, with Bioneers and um, we are hosting a few um, young indigenous women defenders of the Amazon um, who will be on the main stage on Friday the 13th. Um, and there's um, myself, I'll be on a panel with Nina Simons and other colleagues on Friday afternoon. And so many of our, um, our colleagues from around the world will be there. So if you're in the Bay Area, um, join us at Bioneers. If you're not in the Bay Area, um, please sign up and join virtually so that you can um, hear the, the messages from our partners and from the entire Bioneers community, which I can assure you will be super hopeful and inspiring. Thank you for that invitation. And that link is in the chat thread for those of you who would like to see it. Um, again, thank you, Layla. It's lovely to hear from you. I'm so inspired and encouraged. Let me remind our audience again to join you in the lounge after this recording. And for those who may have missed it, please do share this. It will be available in um, the Better TV page on our website. Thank you all for joining us. And thank you, Layla. Job thank well. you. Thank you all.